Damn, they got- You should watch a video on that Australian guy who found an infinite money glitch while using an ATM. What? Australian guy found money glitch. Whoa! You know what's crazy? Yo, no, no funny I did see this before, because when you said that, I automatically thought of this guy's face. Automatically thought of this guy's face. Alright, bro, get to the point, bro. I ain't trying to see no nabs. Let's go. We better watch this video in real motion. 2011, a marine, Australia, a vast land of immense heat, alcohol, and gigantic creatures. More specifically, North East Victoria, in a city called Wangaretta. Now, two fun trivia facts about Wangaretta. One, it has a population of around 29,740 people. And two, it has a funny name. Well, in the city of Wangaretta, it's the protagonist of this story. A man named Dan Saunders. And thanks to an unbelievable discovery, Dan's life was about to change forever. Hold on a second. How exactly did we get here? A brief history lesson on Dan. So he previously worked over in Melbourne at the luxurious Crown Casino, a sprawling casino floor within the Crown Melbourne Resort, featuring 540 tables total, 100 poker tables, and 2,500 poker machines. A job Dan started when he was just 18 years of age. After being caught swimming in the hotel pool and walking through the casino floor with pipes of booze in hand, it was fair to say that his boss didn't have the greatest opinion of him. Well, it was at this job that Dan would meet his future fiance, who after a while would move away to live closer to family. So, of course, Dan followed, making the big move to Wangaratta. Living just down the road, the two safer house together. Dan was the average Aussie fellow simply getting on with life. He worked a brief stint at Nando's and then snagged a job working as a barman pulling beers in the West Side Tavern pub. Now, while somewhat ordinary on the surface, this place becomes quite a spot in this story. It's a small local joint, a few regulars, nothing too fancy. Had decent enough business, it's common knowledge that Aussies need at least one alcoholic beverage a day to survive. If you're a full-grown Aussie, this is what you'd have for breakfast. Please, please. Long neck. Get bro, if you don't understand what he's saying, bro, you might be a dumb. He pretty much said that this guy started at a casino. The, the boss didn't treat him well, so he went to a bar later on where he would meet his fiance there. If you can't hear what he's saying, bro, you don't have 10% of your brain, my I just understood everything he said. And with that, we're up to date in our story. So it's a regular Tuesday night. Dan was finishing up a tyrant shift at the tavern. He mopped the floors, cashed the registers, and locked up as he would at the end of any workday. That wasn't uncommon after work. Dan would go out drinking with friends. And tonight was no different. So to wind down and recover from the lengthy shift of serving all that booze, Dan and his best mate, Mark, went out for booze. Badass. The two hit the town and found themselves in the Bull's Head Hotel Martini Bar in downtown Wangaratta. Mark started off buying the drinks. He'd wave the first few rounds as the two sat- That's what Australian dollars look like? Yo, bro, have y'all seen a bohemian dollar? Bro, who the f is this, dude? Actually smells like an American dollar. It's pretty cool looking. Wait, Bohemian? No, 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 like Bahamas. They call them Bohemians, right? Hold on. I, I don't think they call them Bohemians. Bro, I was calling a bunch of Bahama men Bohemians. Oh my God. What are Bahama people called? Bahamians. I called them niggas Bohemians, bro. Out of the bar chatting away. Well, as the night grew later and the two grew slightly drunker, it was Dan's turn to cover the next round. But as he pulled out his wallet, he quickly realized it had run dry. So staggering out of the bull's head, Dan did what anybody would do in that scenario and searched around for the nearest ATM to reload his wallet. You don't have a credit card? On the dark Wangaratan streets for a while, Dan eventually came across a National Australia Bank ATM. The time was 12.11 a.m. He slid in his card and thumped in his four-digit pin. Now, Dan knew that his savings account had a whole $3 in it, so that wasn't an option. And as for the joint account that Dan shared with his fiance, for any money to be taken out of that, the two of them would have to have signed for it, so that wasn't an option either. He did, though, have a credit card account. But even that, Dan knew was around $2,000 in debt on overdraft. Whoa. Close to its limit. That's so he wasn't pride. Sure if that account would let him withdraw anything. Regardless, he needed cash. The night must go on. So deciding to give it a go, Dan pressed the transfer button and attempted to move a sum of $200 from his credit card account to his savings account. After pressing confirm, he was met with an error message that flashed up on the ATM's display that simply stated, transaction cancelled. The machine also refused to show Dan his saving account balance. Displaying account balance cannot be displayed at this time and spat the card back at him. Confused, Dan reinserted his card and attempted to withdraw the 200 out of his savings. This did a GTA glitch. His account anyway, and the machine dispensed the $200. Not really thinking much of it, Dan assumed that despite the error message, the 200 had just transferred out of his credit card account to his savings as normal. So with $200 cash in hand, he made his way back to the bull's head. Tripping. Rounds I would have been in that Talking about some beep, 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 pulling out 20 bands. So as the early hours of the morning rolled in, at around 1 a.m., Dan and Mark finally decided to call it a night. A morning. Dan pulled himself up from the bar and started walking home in the pouring rain. Making slow progress, tired, drunk, and wet, something caused Dan to stop in his tracks. It caught his glazed eyes, a bright red glow. It was that same NAB ATM that Dan had withdrawn. Nah, this is like that 
the movie where Adam Sandler runs into the genie just earlier in the night. Come the back! Being in an I grant your wish! Pavement being bone dry, Dan decided to seek refuge from the fierce downpour. Dan thought back to earlier in the night with the transaction cancelled message, but the money still dispensing regardless. He thought, hell, I'll give it another go. He took out his card and inserted it. Now, the machine still wouldn't display Dan's saving account balance, but this was expected. So again, Dan did the same. He attempted to transfer $200 from his credit card account to his savings account. Transaction cancelled and his card was spat back out. The card goes back in. Dan tries to withdraw the 200 from his savings and it worked. The machine dispensed the 200 just like earlier. He tried again with $400 this time. Transaction cancelled. Card spat out. Card goes back in and the money dispenses. Bro, you got me f***ed up. I would be there all night. Like I would have, I would literally have that ATM spitting like a s nigga. I'm talking about some <laughs> That is the, that's a crazy money again, glitch. 600, 800, each time, transaction cancelled, but the money kept coming. Dan was baffled. He stood there with nearly $2,000 in cash. There was no way that Dan's credit card account, that was already $2,000 in debt, was approving these transactions. But still somewhat drunk and exhausted, with a long walk ahead of him, he shoved the notes into his wallet and trudged home, crawled into bed. And Tripping. I promise you, I will be there till 6 in the morning with $30,000 in my wallet stuffed in that bitch. i'm talking about blue cheese it, it would look like government cheese on my wallet out it's the next morning dan groggily comes round tired and slightly hungover he assumes the whole atm and money withdrawal the night before was simply a dream but as he picked up his wallet from his side table crammed with nearly two thousand dollars in cash it became very real. Questions started to swirl around Dan's head, but he quite quickly shrugged them off, assuming he'd just have to simply pay all the money back. So he shoved his wallet in his pocket and headed to the tavern for a 3pm shift. Well, on the way there, Dan thought to himself, well, rather than just pay it back right away, I guess whilst I've got the cash, I might as well use it, then just simply pay it back at another time. So he did just that. Over the course of the next couple of days, Dan bought a new fridge for his kitchen and numerous rounds of drinks at the bar. And as he started sitting down at the remaining cash, would you spend it on alcohol? Right at the bull's head, he decided the best option was to gamble it. That's genius. Yes, he thought. If he would, go all in on black, go all in on black, go all in on black. Pay back the 2000 and still have some to keep for himself. Now, you see, the Westside Tavern featured a TAB, which is Australia's biggest sports betting website. So regulars could go into the tavern. Yo, was that two kangaroos fighting? Whilst they were drinking, which is arguably the most Australian thing I have ever heard. So after work, as the tavern closed, Dan would punt the remaining money here. I miss gambling on God. I miss gambling we was on that cruise chat i was losing but i was having the greatest time of my life four hundred dollars in debt on roulette yo give me a hundred boom go all in on a hundred on one number i'm trying to win ten thousand dollars yo give me another one boom a hundred dollars on zero i kept losing i was six hundred dollars in fucking debt and i was having the time of my life bro after a few hours of gambling dan had lost he'd lost it all finished it and his luck Dan decided to call NAB Phone Banking to check his balance. And as he expected, his savings account was down minus $1,997. Ah, uh, he didn't do a glitch. From all the withdrawals that he'd made. But weirdly, when Dan got a statement on his credit card, there was no record of the transfers Dan had made from his credit to his savings at all. Dan could not stop thinking about the night after the bull's head. Dumbass, he was drunk. He even take a penny out of his surely overdrawn credit account. The transaction cancelled message. Why were the transfers that Dad had made between his accounts not showing up on his credit card bank statement? Dan slowly started to piece a theory together in his head, but he had to be sure he needed to try it again. So a couple of days later, around midnight, Dan locked up the tavern for the night and started walking home. There it was, the elusive NAB ATM. Dan's curiosity took the better of him once more. Now the machine actually allowed Dan to see his savings account balance this time. Of course, minus $1,997. So Dan tried something. He attempted to transfer $1,000 from his credit card account to his savings account. And again, that error message that Dan knew too well. Transaction cancelled. But when Dan checked his saving account balance, it was minus $997. So he frantically transferred another $1,000 from his credit to his savings. Transaction cancelled. What? His savings account went back up to three. Yo! He paid off his debt in a matter of seconds. It was clear that this wasn't supposed to be happening. Now, Dan knew the ATM withdrawal limit was a thousand on each card, so he took things slightly further. He transferred yet another two thousand. It is two up the game. 
Bro, how do we get lucky like this? Cash, $1,000 off each card and crammed the notes into his wallet. Dan was really starting to piece things together now, noticing patterns from his various ATM trips. His theory grew. So the next day, Dan became obsessed with checking his bank balance. Calls after calls to NAB. That's where he f***ed up. The phone bank to check the totals and he plotted his results. In the morning, saving account balance, $3, with no record of the transfers on his credit card statement at all. 11 p.m., the same. Saving account balance, $3. Still no record. Is this illegal, chat? The transfers on his credit card statement. 1 a.m., the same. $3 in the savings account, and no record of the transfers on the credit card statement. So after a full day of checking his balance with no change, Dan decides to call it a night. Well, when he awoke at around 6 a.m., Dan sat up in bed. Okay, you're saying it's illegal, but what crime would it be? It's a glitch in their system. How is it illegal? I don't get it. How How is it illegal? My n Dan just getting a f***ing bag because them n***s f***ing up. It's their fault. I thought hell, and he called NAB phone banking once more. Saving account balance, minus 3,900. Oh! All the transactions that Dan had made oh! caught up, and there was still no record. I just touched my f***ing hair. Damn it, I wasn't supposed to touch that. It's too much grease. On his credit card statement at all. And with that, Dan's Dan theory, theory was correct. What exactly was happening? What was Dan's theory? Well, what Dan had worked out after repeated calls to phone banking to check his statements at different times of the day and his numerous trips to the ATM was between 12 and 1 a.m. The NAB ATMs would go into a status called standby mode. And whilst in this mode, the NAB banking network would just seemingly disconnect from their ATMs. This meant that in short, the network couldn't actually see Dan's credit card balance and would just auto approve whatever transfer amount Dan would key in, allowing him to move up to six figures at a time from his credit card account to his savings account and spend it as normal. All whilst the ATMs were in this sort of limbo period. And despite the error message, the money would transfer. But these transfers wouldn't show up on Dan's credit card statement. Although, here's the kicker. Roughly 24 hours after the payments are made, around 3 to 5 a.m. the next day, the NAB network would catch up, realize the false transactions, and auto-reverse the transactions out of Dan's savings account, putting his account in. I have the smartest idea. If I was Dan, I would have put out a million dollars out of that f***ing credit card, right? Boom. Go to the f***ing casino. Go all in on black. I'm trying to tell you, you pay off the debt and you got a f***ing million dollars on your hand. Bro, what? I would never touch the ATM again. Flip that a million into a $400,000 house. Have $600,000 left over for renovation. Fixer upper. Own that for rent. Oh my, bro, I'm trying to tell you. Nobody would ever know, bro. Debt. But damn had a solution. All he had to do was just stay ahead of the bank. So he could transfer an amount, spend that money on his card as normal. Then the next night, just a couple hours before the payments reverse, Dan goes to the NAB ATM and just simply transfers double the last amount to keep the balance topped up. So when the network would catch up and the transaction would reverse, he still had cash in there, like a buffer, stopping the account going into debt and the bank being alerted. And he just had to keep that loop up, seemingly creating cash from nowhere. It was genius. This Dan is a genius. What in the f is showing to take a small break? It's time for the ads. Oh, yeah. I'm so with the secret early morning ATM glitch crammed in the back of Dan's brain, he decided the best option was to keep it to himself. Sure, he could probably tell his Smart. mates in the pub, but was it even worth the risk? Don't tell a single soul. Bro, one thing about humans, no matter what it is, you start telling them how to get money, niggas will do it, bro. They'll spread that like wildfire. There's one thing that niggas will always switch up on you for. It's money, bro. If somebody didn't secretly report Dan, they'd go and try and take cash out for themselves and potentially expose the entire operation. Dan didn't even tell his fiance. I mean, the two didn't live together and she was a primary school religious education teacher. No, I'm kidding. Oh my God. No f that shout out to her. Prove of what he was doing. He decided it was best to keep the whole thing hush and cover it up, but he needed a plan. He didn't know the full scope of things right now, but he knew he could use the money he was taking out of the ATM to make more money. You see, Dan knew a few horse trainers from an old job, and they'd give him tip-offs on the horses that looked in the best condition for race day. So all Dan had to do was take the cash out of the ATM and place bets on those specific horses and wait for the money to roll in. But he couldn't do it alone. So one night at the bull's head, Dan is out drinking with Mark again, and they meet up with a- He told Mark this is where he f***ed up. 18-year-old Ivano. Whoa! Some regulars from the tavern. Dan is buying every single drink that's coming in, and the group can't help but question Dan on where all the cash had come from. He bats it away and claims that he won big on a bet, and using the money, the group of them 
could bet on horses and make more cash. So within a few minutes, Dan had built a makeshift gambling posse. The group would even bond over leaving $10 notes on the floor and watching people find them just for the fun of it. So with the team assembled, Oh, I'm liking this story. This is coming up. Hey, once them feds come in, that's where the story get good, nigga. It get good, nigga. The plan kicked into motion. Each night, Dan would head out in that 12 to 1am time slot, order a taxi and transfer money from his credit card account to his savings account. Over the span of a week, Dan had transferred and spent nearly $20,000. He was buying round after round at the bar. He gave yep. his fiance $1,000. And then each night, after his shift, the group would be putting bets on horses using Dan's money. Now, whilst the I love gambling, bro. This shit makes me so f***ing horny, bro. I'm trying to tell you, chat. Anytime I see a risking his whole bank account for something that has a 75%, 30% chance turns me on, bro. Dan had a few small <laughs> It was a fast downward spiral. Dan was losing big. One Wednesday night, the West Side Tavern was dead empty. It was just Dan and Mark sat at the bar betting on racing, and Dan was $40,000 in the hole, hopelessly trying to win it all back. At points throughout the week, Dan was even using the TAB whilst he was on shift working behind the bar. And of course, whenever he'd go down, one trip to the ATM during the early hours of the morning, and he was back up again. It was fair to say that this- He's kind of a dumbass, though. Because, like, bro, you should have waited till you had, like, a million dollars at least in your bank account before you start throwing that away gambling. This is why sometimes can't get money, bro. Like, can't be millionaires. Like, that's why you can't make a person like this a millionaire. The plan that Dan had designed wasn't exactly going smoothly. But things would get far worse. One morning, Dan awoke to a phone call from his boss, Paul, the owner of the West Side Tavern. He told Dan he needed to come into work early and come straight into the office. Well, as Dan stepped through the door, there stood Paul on a conference call to the TAB executives. They informed Dan that they'd been tracking his spending habits through the TAB system in the tavern. Well, shit. You see, Dan and Mark had gambled more money in a single night than the tavern TAB would pull in in an entire month. So understandably, they'd noticed a slight spike on their charts. Dan he f***ed up, bro. That's where the IRS gets involved. instantly fired on the spot. And was what? Told he couldn't work anywhere with the TAB for at least a year. Within the morning, Dan had lost his job. Okay, so you're firing a... You're telling me you're firing a that's making you money. But it didn't stop there. The news of Dan's firing spread like wildfire around the tavern. All the regulars were talking about it. And with Wangaratta not being the biggest city, within a couple of hours, Dan's fiance had heard the news, along with the eye-watering amounts that had left Dan's bank account. She assumed he was performing some illegal activity to obtain the money he was gambling with. So without any chance of explanation, she broke up with him via text. I'm not sure what you're into. I want no part of it. It's done. This hit Dan in the space of a day. I would be in that f***ing ATM. Bro, I'm trying to tell you, I would make $7 million and I would literally be on a yacht with bad naked eating my d nigga on recording and sending it to that He'd lost his job and his fiance of four years. You still got an ATM though? No. They were engaged. <sighs> Dan was heartbroken. He pretty quickly decided he had no real reason to stay in Wangaratta. So he called Mark and for the first time, revealed the glitch. Now Mark, being a pretty laid back guy, wasn't too baffled with the whole thing. He sort of took it in a way of, okay Dan, that's your thing. I don't want anything to do with it, but. I f***ed up, why would you tell him? I'll have beers with you. Why would you tell with him? Mark having a few days off, Dan thought screw it and booked a train to Melbourne for the two of them in an attempt to distract himself, to take his mind off everything that had happened in the last 48 hours. The train screeched into Melbourne in the dead of night and the two wandered the streets for a while, eventually reaching the Crown Plaza Hotel. Aye, right, so he's in Melbourne. Melbourne. And a bouncer reared his head. He took one look at the two of them that appeared tired and slightly disheveled and claimed the place was full. But Dan and Mark soldiered on and found themselves in the Crown Towers hotel lobby. Dan walked up to the desk and booked a twin room for Mark and himself. And boy, was it snazzy. It was a taste of luxury for the Boy, was it snazzy. Mark a small remote he found on the side table, clicked the button and watched the automatic blind slide to reveal the incredible views of Melbourne. Mark turned to Dan. A smile grew across his face. God, Dan, can you imagine this being your life, mate? Dan paused. Remembering everything that had happened in the past couple of weeks. The glitch, the gambling, losing his job, the breakup. He looked down at the bank card that he used to purchase the very room they stood in. He looked Mark in the eyes and said, why couldn't it be? It was here. Yeah, did. Yeah, did. Ah, did. Within Dan, Dan about to snap. Taste of what big he about to did. snap. Through the glitch. I like it, Dan. Sort of He'd been granted endless funds to play around with, to make memories with. So, still staying in a hotel room above the Crown Plaza, the two did their favourite thing. They gambled. A lot. I mean, they were losing most nights, but who cared? The two lived to gamble each night. Tell me they won! Tell me they 
One. Or roulette tables or any machines that they could get their hands on. And of course, each night, Dan was making a trip to the ATM to keep his account topped up. Now, alongside the original glitch, Dan had actually discovered a further loophole that allowed him to transfer money from his credit card account to his credit card account. Then he could use his internet banking to shift huge sums of cash between his accounts, then spend the cash as normal. But what's most important to understand about this extra loophole is that not only did it allow Dan to take money out of the original ATM in Wangaratta, but from any NAB ATM anywhere in Australia. Oh, yeah, bro. This on demon time after a few days the casino binge eventually came to an end as mark had to head back to wangaratta for work which left dan sitting <laughs> that work luxury crown hotel room alone but not for long he made a call to an old friend from his casino job now this friend's identity isn't public so we'll call him richard listen richard mate drop whatever you're doing come down to the crown towers out by the beers just come and visit richard was understandably confused but he thought hey dan if you're buying the beers mate i'll be right down so the two meet in the hotel bar later that night richard was he trying to him. my hotel room at midnight i want to show you something admittedly slightly puzzled richard no he's about to tell richard this is where he f***s up why would you tell a regular a regular schmegular dude it goes along with it so they drop his bags off in the hotel room as the clock strikes midnight dan takes richard across the river to the closest nab atm dan Dumbass. inserts his card as richard looks over his shoulder saving cap balance seven thousand dollars wow dan good going mate seven thousand dollars that's no watch Dan interrupts. He transfers $50,000. Transaction cancelled. Oh, Dan, look, mate. There's an error message on the screen. Wait, Dan says. Saving account balance, $57,000. Richard was mind blown. Do you want me to do it again? Dan asks. Yeah, do it again, Richard says. $50,000 more. Transaction cancelled. Saving account balance, $107,000. Richard likes that. Had finally bared witness to the glitch in person with their own eyes. So the two race back up to the hotel room and Dan sits Richard down. Richard. Oh, they're about to start. He's like, Dan, give me 50,000. Give me 50,000. Give me 50,000. Good listen. We're above the Crown Casino. Let's get gambling. I'm in a big hole. I need to win this money back. In fact, Dan had actually won 40,000 on a betting site earlier that day. But when he went to bet 10k more, the site called him directly and told him that because he'd won so much, his max bet was capped to only 1,000. Richard looks slightly confused. Wait, Dan, let me get this right. So you're telling me you can magic money out of nowhere every single night? Dan nodded his head. Then why are you gambling? Richard asked. Thank you! Why try and win the money back when you can just make it appear from nowhere? I mean, I just watched you transfer $100,000 at that ATM across the river. You have a holy grail, Dan. Dan realized Richard was right. Why was he even wasting time gambling to try and win the money back? He had a method that was allowing him to move up to six figures at a time at any NAB ATM across Australia. He thought, well, I'm surely going to jail for what I'm doing, so I might as well make the most of it. Dan vowed to live each day better than the last. So the next morning, he called Ivano and Mark and they headed down on the train. So Dan, Mark, Ivano, and Richard all gathered in the hotel room. Richard's the one that snitched if his identity's not even like in this video. Richard is the weak link, my Richard, damn it. And over the course of the next few months, the group would go crazy. It started that very night. Out bar hopping they went. Dan shouting every drink that was coming in. Handing Ivano stacks of cash. Splashing on whatever he liked. Every person they ran into, they'd invite to luxury penthouse parties. I guess when you walk into a bar and wave every single person's order, you start to turn heads. From that point onwards, Dan and the group would travel exclusively by pristine stretch limos. Walking through designer outlets and clearing them out. Damn. Gucci, Prada, Louis Vuitton. Buying whatever he or the people he was with wanted. Nice. Dan became somewhat of a human ATM. Handing out cash left right and center but he made sure to put others before himself he knew he had the power to grant people things that would take them years to get he'd frequently hand waiters hundreds of dollars in tips and he paid off all of his french student debts in a single day one of dan's lady friends told him about her lifelong dream to fly to france and learn french in a paris university he f***ed her in paris this is in paris <laughs> This is in Paris. Talk, took her shopping for everything she needed, and like that, she bro, was buy property. He's wildin'. I already know where he's gonna go. Day, and he came across a busker that he really enjoyed, but nobody was really stood around watching. Besides. Dan, of course. So he walked into a music store, bought all new gear, and started secretly paying passing bystanders $50 to just stand and watch the busker. It got to the point where the crowd had grown so large, they started to slow down the trams in the street. Random acts of kindness seemed to be Dan's preferred way of spending. He was addicted to it, you could say. It was That's real! Every single night. Dan was sat having dinner at a teppanyaki grill, and he got speaking to a lovely couple that mentioned they wanted to go on their dream vacation to Hawaii, but couldn't afford it. So they decided to stay in Australia, and planned a trip to Queensland instead. And upon hearing that dan slams a louis vuitton bag on the table unzips it full of cash here twenty thousand dollars go to hawaii he smirked he loved it dan would also befriend people without a place to stay for the night and buy them rooms in the hilton hotel so they could have a shower and a good okay bro this this is a real ass
but dude, you have to invest in property, bro. You're going to lose all that money. Rest. And on one occasion, Dan got a call from the hotel informing him that one of the rooms that he bought for somebody had been stripped of all of its robes, all of its towels. This is why you can't give rich niggas. Bro. And the kettle. Well, this was G -G. a problem for Dan. He chuckled and related the theft of a kettle to his theft from the NAB. And he told the hotel manager to cover the costs of the stolen items on his card. Now, with the limit on the transfers being a maximum of six figures, at the height of the binge, Dan was transferring hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time. But instead of spending it directly off his card, and the ATM withdrawal limit being only $1,000 per card, Dan would walk straight into NAB branches and just ask to withdraw the cash. And the bank was clueless. Dan would ask to withdraw $100,000 and the bank tellers would head in the back for abnormally long amounts of time. Dan would start to panic and sweat, thinking he'd been exposed. And then they'd come right out and just hand him the cash like it was nothing. In fact, when Dan would be out spending thousands of dollars in designer stores, he'd get phone calls from the bank. Sir, did you just spend $15,000 in the Louis Vuitton store? Was that you? And Dan would just simply reply, yeah, that was me. Oh, okay, no problem. Just making sure. Thank you for banking with us, sir. Well, that was the What the Bro, this had to be a long time ago because now I can't even spend a hundred dollars at a f supermarket without getting a text. Oh, we uh, we identified that your card is used for fraud. Like, was this you? Reply yes. Like, what? Nothing. The mornings after Dan would transfer, the bank would call him up and ask, Sir, did you just transfer nine hundred thousand dollars into your savings account? And Dan would coolly respond, I mean, yeah, I was pretty drunk last night, but I don't even think that's possible, is it? The line would go silent. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. That is impossible. Uh, must be a glitch on our end. Sorry to bother you, sir. Have a good day. Dan wasn't avoiding the bank by any means. In fact, throughout the entire binge, he spoke to them on the phone around 70 to 100 times. Now, whilst Dan was extremely generous, it wasn't without people trying to exploit him. But he could smell when somebody was trying to take the piss. Sure, if he knew something was $400 and somebody had asked for $500, that's fine. No problem. And anything for the boys. But Dan wasn't going to let people try and make a fool of him. One girl approached Dan asking if she could have $500 to buy a new dress. A you gonna suck my d <laughs> Hey, I get you that dress, you better be- Of course, Dan gave her, with no hesitation. Then she came back a second time, and asked for more money to buy a pair of shoes. He gave her more. Then she came back a third time. She needed more money for jewellery. So Dan had her locked out of the hotel. Or a similar scenario, where two women asked Dan for 1,000 to- Fool me one time, shame on you. Fool me twice, can't put the blame on you. Fool me three times, <laughs> You mean, nigga? A certain substance. What do you mean? Knowing that amount was far too high for two bags, Dan still handed the cash over. But as the two left the hotel doors, Dan called reception and told them to not let the two back in. Now, whilst this rapid spending spree seemed somewhat chaotic or sporadic, after a few weeks, the group decided that if they were going to continue, they had to create a sort of strategy. Stop things getting messy, a method to their madness. Firstly, the backstory to cover their tracks. If anyone asked, they all agreed they would say they worked in finance as a cover-up for the glitch. Dan was the mastermind of the entire operation. He knew the glitch through and through by this point. It was Dan's job to stay ahead of things. He'd disappear from the party scene every night at midnight or set alarms to wake up, head to the nearest NAB ATM and transfer cash to his accounts to keep them topped up and keep suspicion low from NAB. I mean, if Dan missed just one night, his accounts would drop into debt and the whole thing would fall apart. So before the group would go anywhere for the night, they'd scout the location for the nearest NAB ATMs. And being the National Australia Bank, that wasn't very difficult. In fact, Dan was going to the... My question is... Well, actually, no, they probably wouldn't get an alert because it's virtual money. It's not even real money. Uh, the cash would be probably a concerning thing because ATMs have a limit with cash in it, doesn't it? ATMs so often, even the taxi drivers were curious. Hey, mate, how come you keep going downtown at 1am every single night? And Dan would just lie. He'd claim that he was into the stock exchange and he had to transfer cash in the early hours of the morning to invest. Then he'd slip the driver a 50 for a $10 ride and race to the ATM. He did this every single night. Now, Richard's logic was if the group were going to be in expensive, luxurious locations around wealthy individuals, real millionaires. They That's smart too. Bro, why you think, bro, we watched a video on why Lil Baby be hanging out with Diddy and, you know, all that he about to face a RICO charge. Once you start hanging out with higher ups, you associate yourself with millionaires, that makes you guilty by association. So now you're a millionaire with them, my nigga, even if you're broke. The brokest nigga can hang out with millionaires right now, he's gonna be a millionaire within a year, bro. Cause it's, they, they know everything, bro. They know everything. You gotta fake it till you make it, bro. Got to look the part. <sighs> Brand new tailored Hugo Boss suits every single day. They all carried around Louis Vuitton gym bags filled with cash. Yeah, that was Richard's idea. They this started at a bar watching kangaroo fights, bro. 
Like, take that in, in bro. Bodyguards got spray tans and attended regular spa treatments to look pampered, fresh faced, and rich. The group would waltz into expensive restaurants, look for the wealthiest put together person in the venue, then they would walk up to the table and offer to buy them the most expensive bottle of wine on the menu. That's sort of literally, yo, on God. That was the name of the fing wine that was in Miami. Bro, Vater Futer, bro, it was $9,500 for that bottle of wine on the menu as a sort of warning call. Hey, listen, buddy, you might be loaded, but we'll outspend you. So with the binge scripture finally laid out, thinking it could all fall apart any minute, Dan started embracing the high life. He knew what he was doing was illegal, but he knew if the shoe was on the other foot, the bank would milk it. He felt like he owed the world a service, so the party raged on. Dan rented a minibus, driving around Melbourne, stopping off at hostels, picking up groups of talk. This guy was living like it was his last. Yo, I'm trying to tell you, though, the case that they probably had built on him because they know all this information. Bro, he's probably still in prison right now. Travelers, backpackers in droves, packing a bus full and taking them to Yarra Valley, where he would host exclusive... And Richard was the one that snitched. I'm calling it, bro. They, they didn't even show his identity. ...pool parties for nights on end with free drinks, caterers, and a DJ. He booked a table at Rock Pool Bar and Grill in Melbourne. And after his meal, Dan covered the cost of every single table with cash. Now this attracted attention, and when one of the workers came up to Dan and whispered, are you the richest man in Australia? He thought to himself, hell no I'm not. You've got people like Solomon Lou and a bunch of other minted Aussies. So with this in mind, he looked her dead in the eyes and replied, no, I'm the seventh richest. <laughs> we did with Yo! The meals, the that was confident with it. I'm the seventh. They give me and give people 500 bucks to run up to active games of roulette and just bro you know how much this probably got bro the ball out in one fancy italian restaurant that the group visited they knew it was tradition that the place would serve that a gas. crystal bowl full of tiramisu as dessert for tables full of guests so with that in mind dan called one of the waiters over to his table and asked him if anybody had ever dropped the bowl the waiter shook his head and explained if anybody ever did that they'd be fired on the spot. We're careful around here. The group smirked. And five minutes later, there was an almighty crash as a bowl full of tiramisu hurtled to the floor and smashed everywhere. Dan walked into Vera Wang with a female friend of his. All right, this is crashing out, bro. Bought her a wedding dress, bought himself a new suit, and the two went on a night out. And I know his girlfriend pissed. His old girlfriend that broke up with him, I know she's pissed. They just got married to get free drinks. The more people Dan got to know, Taxi drivers turned into limo drivers. Limo drivers turned into pilots. It was choppers from one building in Melbourne to another. But by far Dan's biggest purchase, a $90,000 chartered flight in a 20-seat private jet that he used to fly to an Asian island near Bali, where he proceeded to take over the entire island for the next two days straight. Champagne, caviar, beautiful views. Dan had it all. Day after day, Dan was living out his wildest of adventures. Endless luxuries, the high-flying life, all on cash that wasn't even his. He'd come a long way from pulling pints in Wangaratta. He is tripping though. He is tripping. You, he really should have invested some of that into like some type of investment, bro. Even a franchise, bro. Well, there was one plan that the guys came up with that blew all the others out of the water. So the NAB headquarters in Melbourne. Tell me he's going to buy it, bro. If he bought a f***ing, bro, if he bought a percentage of NAB, that would be the smartest thing, bro. Because then, bro, what? Nigga, they couldn't say. 800 Bork Street and the Watermark Docklands, a regular spot that the gang love to dine at, is located right here, basically next door. Interesting. So one morning, Richard and Dan decided to design a poster. NAB staff party at the Watermark Docklands, Friday, all drinks free. So they printed it out, headed to said NAB headquarters and placed the poster right at the entrance, a spot where conveniently every single NAB staff member would walk past every single morning. So cut to Friday night, the Watermark Docklands is swarming with 400 to 600 NAB staff members. Richard stands on a table and makes a toast. The room goes deadly silent. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, NAB. You really have been good to us and our business this year. This would really not be possible without you. The room erupts into applause. <laughs> Yo! Thank you guys for letting me steal all your ATM money, bitch ass nigga. He just threw it in their face. They had the NAB on strings. They were hosting a party for the workers of the bank that they were robbing blind but as applies to everything in this life all good things come, to, come an to an end. end yeah now this is the part of the story where you expect that nab caught up with what dan was doing and he was thrown in handcuffs but it wasn't anywhere 
near as simple as that. So towards the end of the binge, as Dan would wake up each morning on the floor of some random hotel penthouse, surrounded by empty bottles and loose cash that he'd partied the previous night in, he'd think to himself, who am I? What do I stand for? Have I pushed the envelope? Too? There we go. He, he, he he's, sta he's starting to burn out. What? He'd head down to the day spa to sweat his hangover out. Dan lived each day not knowing if this would be the day that the whole operation would fall apart. He became paranoid, constantly looking over his shoulder. He was riddled with guilt. One afternoon, Dan drifted into a... He sh I, I mean, okay, I would be riddled with guilt, but he's giving back to people in a sense where it's like you, you, you have a good intention. But you really should have invested some of that. You feel me? Because even then, can, if, 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 if he would have invested any of that, can the police take that investment away from him? Like, say he owns millions of properties. Just like the Umi and the Hellcat nigga. They didn't take all of his property, did they? He still has property in his name. Oh, bro, if he was in America, he'd be done, bro. They'll take it? Damn. Deep sleep in his hotel bed. And he had a vivid dream of the SWAT team swarming his hotel room. Then he awoke to a knock at the door, convincing himself that the nightmare had personified itself. He opened the door, and it was the housekeeper with towels for the room, which he needed because he was soaked with sweat. Dan had very rapidly developed severe anxiety, suffering from regular attacks, things getting so bad at points, he'd struggle to even stand. He'd have regular heart palpitations, and he developed a severe twitch in his right eye, as the vessels would spasm. The bank would continue to call Dan regularly. Each time, he'd assume it was all over, but they were just checking on him to confirm his payments yet again. He felt it was finally time. He had to call an end to the whole thing. It was taking such a toll on his mental and physical health by the day that he genuinely thought he was going to die. So Dan, with his eye rapidly twitching, had made his decision. He just stopped. He went cold turkey. No more spending. He called the guys into the hotel room one last time and broke the news that it was all coming to an end. Dan pulled out his laptop, opened internet banking, and told the group that they could transfer any final sum of cash into their personal accounts. And after that, he was done. So as the boys headed back to Wangaretta, for the first night in months, Dan didn't leave the hotel room. He didn't top his account. Now he paranoid. He's paranoid. And he climbed into bed and went to sleep. So with Dan not making his nightly ATM trip to stay ahead of the reverse payments, his savings account had fallen into $1.6 million of debt. Yo! So the next morning, with the remaining- He's a dumbass. 80,000 cash in a Hilton laundry bag. He checked into a more affordable hotel nearby, got into his room, and poured the money into the bathtub. There was the last of the cash from the binge, sat right in front of Dan. $80,000. So Dan walked to the nearest NAB branch, dialed the house phone, and raised it to his ear. A man named Bernie answered the call. Dan confessed that there had been some weird transactions on his account, but Bernie was stern. Listen, Mr. Saunders, you aren't getting any more money, and I think you know why. Now, Dan thought two things in his head. One, well, I don't want any more money. And two, yeah, what is actually happening with all of that? Dan asked, and Bernie responded sharply. Well, you're going to jail, Mr. Saunders. It's a police matter now. You've ruined your life. Yo, they already knew. Yo, <laughs> this n gave up at the exact right time. I ain't gonna lie, bro. I would just turn myself in when I heard that. But oh no, no. Ah, this nigga Dan done. This nigga Dan done. Hey, the FBI on his ass. The call on his ass. Hostile interaction. Dan had basically just confessed directly to NAB. So now the police smash through Dan's hotel room and smack him in handcuffs. Well, not exactly. A month passed. The remaining 80k had almost run dry. Dan was still 1.6 million dollars in debt and still he'd heard nothing. On the bright side, his eyes were building a case on him. Cleared up. So Dan decided it was best to head back to Wangaratta. Three months had passed. Still, Dan hadn't heard a thing. No police, no NAB, nothing. Well, this went on for three years. That's why it's 2011, bro. It's 2014, and Dan is living in Queensland at this point. He had scammed the NAB of $1.6 million, and there wasn't a single consequence. Dan had assumed that the NAB had simply written the debt off, but he just wanted a simple status on that police investigation that Bernie had mentioned. He wanted closure more than anything. They were building that case. Whilst Dan he should have turned himself in that day. They hadn't come for him for three years. He didn't know if they'd come for him one day. He had visions of growing old with children and the police turning up and arresting him for a glitch that happened back in 2011. Funnily enough, the person that wanted justice the most was Dan himself. Then, he had an idea. If they weren't going to come for him, he was going to go to them. He was going to use the media to out his story publicly and get himself caught. So firstly, Dan...
That is probably the smartest thing to do. I ain't gonna lie. That is probably the smartest thing to do, nigga. Contacted the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper and shared his story. They took it on and a journalist met with Dan. They stuck him in a suit, then in a private jet and took some flashy photos. The story was out there. The glitch, the binge, all of it. This was it. Surely Dan is done for now. Lock him up and throw away the key. But still, nothing. Nobody. So Dan decides what the to push it up. He makes an appearance <sighs> on a current affair. This was primetime Australian television, and there was Dan telling his story to millions. Probably looked like a, a fat white Kanye West, but you know. This was bound to- W! He knows Kanye! <laughs> Yo, W dead! That nigga know the goats on God! The story out there. Dan would finally get an answer. What the police were doing this entire time. How the nearly two year long investigation was going. But as Dan sat down that night to watch his story be told on a current affair, he heard something he didn't expect for a second. We did, however, speak with him by phone and encourage him to hand himself in. At this stage, he's chosen not to contact police who now want to arrest him. If you know- Ah. Uh, Y'all appreciate, appreciate the motherfucking Ray, my boy. Know his whereabouts, contact Crime Stoppers on 1800- He should have just turned himself in because now he's- Triple three, triple zero. Dan was baffled. A current affair was claiming they didn't know where Dan was, and this was the first he'd heard of an arrest warrant in three years. Well, it turned out the entire time there was no police investigation. It was all a lie. Bernie on the phone saying it was a police matter. Well, NAB had never even contacted the police in the first place. Only after the show had aired, had a current affair producer personally contacted his friend who was an officer and told him about Dan. Three. This might be the most dumbest alive chat. This is really, this whole video is your mind is your worst enemy, bro. Your mind is your worst enemy, bro. Holy Nigga never would have had the police on him, bro. Ever, bro. He's a dumbass. Three whole years after the glitch. Well, later that Monday night, the 3rd of November, 2014, after the show had aired, Dan received an email from one of the producers. To Dan Saunders, thanks for your email, Dan. You're a funny bloke and have a way with words. I trust Adam has been in touch to let you know that the story is still running tonight. I hope you like the final product. You're more than welcome to the news, too. Them niggas contacted the police? Collect the documents and photos whenever you like. I'm out of the office for the next couple of days, but we'll be back here on Thursday. Alternatively, I can have them posted to you. Whichever is easier, just let me know. Alex. Now Dan could see right through this, but wanting it all over with, as Thursday rolled around, Dan turns up to the Occurrent Affair Channel 9 headquarters, and seemingly, out of nowhere, a swarm of cameras surround him, and he's arrested on the spot. Now, Dan was pretty unfazed by the whole stick-up operation. Whilst it may have looked like a huge we got ya sting of a criminal on the run, Dan had basically been waiting and actively chasing his own arrest for the last two years. And finally- Yeah, that nigga was dumb paranoid. It had I've never heard of a guy trying to chase their own arrest. On live television. So at the station, the police took Dan's fingerprints and all of his information, but no officers actually interviewed him. I mean, there never was a police investigation. They just opened one to get an arrest warrant after the current affair broadcast and arrested Dan because he'd confessed on TV. It's not like they collected any data or evidence to interrogate Dan on. So after being put in a holding cell for a while, Dan is eventually released on bail. And within that very night, a current affair did a news update saying that Dan Saunders, the master criminal, had finally been arrested. Master Overall, criminal. Dan was being charged with three charges by the Crown Prosecutor. Charge one claims that Dan stole the amount of $80,222 from the National Australia Bank. Charge two stated that he owed payments of debts using a National Australia Bank MasterCard, totaling the amount of $146,800 and 20 cents. And the third charge were further payments of $21,574. That ain't even to what he was spending. Bro, this nigga was damn near a millionaire. And 92 cents. According to Dan, the court case was a mess. The judge had no idea what Dan had even done. NAB had only provided a couple of bank statements and they actually played the heavily edited news broadcast from the current affair episode as evidence in the courtroom. Well, in the end, bro, this a dumbass. Dan pled guilty to all charges and was sentenced to 12 months in a max security prison. Yo, that's a W. Community correctional order. And he was made to pay back 250 That's a W, bro. Nah, that's a W because he could have... 
Bro, that could have been way worse. Thousand dollars. Now as for why Dan didn't have to pay. But money, this nigga's a for going on the news. One point six million dollars back. I can only assume that was down to the mess of evidence and little bank statements that NAB had provided. And you may be asking yourself, why did the NAB never really chase Dan up? Why was a police investigation not opened? Why did it take so long? Well, think. If you were the NAB, why would you want a story to go public of a man that had basically magicked millions of dollars from an NAB ATM, then all NAB customers, seeing that as a security threat, and moving banks? Exactly, bro. Bro, I don't know why Dan didn't think with his f***ing brain, but bro, he could have made a sh ton of money, nigga. Fucking huge company loss. <sighs> it almost made sense for them to stay hush. Dan was eventually released from prison in May of 20. No, if this was the US, he would have been done, bro. After it would have been a months, federal crime. He gradually served his additional 18 months of community service. So as of today, Dan lives a calmer, far simpler life. He works as a carer in the day and has a restaurant job that he works at night. Dan is supposedly meant to be paying back the money from the court case, but not much has really been chased up on. Dan claims that's because he doesn't really have much money to give at the moment. Dan is now in the process of writing a book about his story and is signed on to make a Hollywood movie about the events that unfolded that is apparently now in pre-production. And I just want to say, if you're going to take anything from this That's going to be a good-ass movie. And listen to oh God, that's going to be a good-ass movie. The Glitch podcast on Spotify, as well as Willem Powerfish's interview oh, with Dan. They've both been unbelievable resources in the making of this video and are both linked below. I know I've mentioned a lot in this video, but there's so many little anecdotes and details that are just great to hear. Dan's stories from prison, things I can't mention on YouTube, and Dan's personality is one oh, of he the, got in prison, didn't he? the funniest, most endearing. Hey, I've give me that ass! He really is the life of this whole story. I highly recommend you go and hear it directly from his mouth. So, if you watched this point in the video, thank you ever so Richard didn't snitch. Did they make the movie? I want to watch it. Only a couple niggas that I know will kill me. She said when I fuck, I get her in a feeling. Shorty is slutty when she off the Hennessy. Bitch, they feeling I go over here.